Okay, good morning to all of you who are here. And we'll get into 1st Samuel. All right, so last week we did uh, the book of Ruth. And on Tuesday, I could not take a class. Uh, but yeah, today we will have 1st Samuel. Uh, it actually is on. You guys can't hear, is it? Uh, online, they're saying that they can hear me, which I'm very glad about. But uh, you, maybe you could, uh, one of you could, you know, call Milken, and uh, maybe he can do come and do something about it. So, could we have one volunteer to just quickly go up to him, and um, you know, in case my voice is not very clear. If one person can go and call Milken. Mm -hmm. But online, it seems to be all right. One, two, three. Seems to be all right. So, um, online, it's perfectly fine. So let's just get started. You can open your ears wide. Or you can bring pull up your uh, table a little closer. <laughs> OK, let's actually begin 1 Samuel. Um, now, 1 Samuel is a narrative history. It basically talks about Samuel and Saul and David. These are the three main characters who are covered in our uh, 1 Samuel. They say that most probably the first 24 chapters were written by Samuel himself uh, because uh, he was alive during those events. But chapter 25 on but chapter 26 onwards, um, those are events which took place after his death. So obviously, it means that someone else would have recorded those events. So they say that most probably it was uh, Nathan or Gad. You know, the prophets, um, they are probably the ones who most probably recorded the events which took place after Samuel's death. Um, if we can have the students actually settle down and stop moving about, yeah, it's kind of distracting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right, so um, the prophets probably would have recorded the events. And then someone later on must have brought all the records together and compiled it into one single writing at a later point of time. Why do we say that? Uh, because in 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 6, it talks about the kings of Judah. So the kings of Judah is a term that would have been used after the Israelite kingdom was split up into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Judah. So uh, if this term is now being used over here in 1 Samuel, it means that whoever did the final compilation, whoever did the final editing of this particular book uh, would have done it sometime after the death of Solomon, because it's only after Solomon's time that the kingdom got split up into two. And that is when the term kings of Judah would have been written at all. So that is why we can say that Samuel probably wrote the first 24 books. The events which took place after his death probably would have been recorded by Nathan or Gad or any of the other prophets. And finally, after the time of Solomon, someone must have brought all the records together and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit would have edited it and compiled it into this final document which we have with us today. All right. So coming to the structure of First Samuel, the first seven chapters mainly focus on Samuel. Uh, that is where we, we uh, get to know about how the Ark of the Covenant was taken away by the Philistines, uh, the plagues which come upon the Philistines because they have taken the ark and how they return it back. All of those things are mentioned in the first seven chapters. Chapters 8 to 15 talk about Saul mainly. That is where we get to see Saul. And uh, we get to know that Saul uh, was appointed and anointed by God 
but then he was also rejected by the Lord due to his disobedience. Those are the main things that we see in this section. The third section, maybe we could say, is 16 to 31, because that is where you have um, David uh, being mainly focused upon. So in this section, we see um, David being chased by Saul. He is, uh, he's worried about his life, and he's trying to escape again and again. And uh, he also gets a chance to attack Saul and kill him, but he does not do that because he says that uh, Saul has been anointed by God. And so if God wishes to, God must kill him. I do not have the right to kill him. So he chooses not to do that. And then, of course, we also see how Saul ends his life. He uh, commits suicide. So all of these things are recorded in the last section, chapter 16 to 31. Coming to Samuel, just to talk a little bit about him. Um, he was considered one of the most uh, popular, respected, revered uh, you know, uh, prophets of his time. And um, he functioned in three main capacities. He was a judge. He actually held court, solved you know, civil cases and criminal cases. He actually served as a judge. We see that in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 15 to 17 where it talks about how he would go to four different places and hold court over there so that people can bring their cases over there. And he would sit as judge over there and solve those cases. He would uh, reach a judgment regarding those things. So um, if someone could turn to 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 15 to 17, and if you could kindly tell me which are the four places from where he functioned as judge. because. Yeah. And the fourth place. Yes. So these are the four places where he would travel to during different parts of the year. So one part of the year, he would be in one location, then he would move to a different location. And he was actually serving as a legal judge. He was also a priest. Uh, which meant mainly that he would intercede for the people. Um, we see an example of that in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 5 to 8. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 5 to 8, um, this is basically after the ark of God is returned by the Philistines. So all the people, they admit that they have sinned against God. And because of that, the, the glory of God had left them. Now they are repentant of what they have done. They want to come back to the Lord. And to come back to the Lord is not an easy thing in the sense God is extremely holy and he cannot put up with sinful behavior. He must judge them for what they have done. So they uh, turn to Samuel to intercede for them. So Samuel intercedes for them. And so all the people gather together at Mizpah, where Samuel intercedes on their behalf so that the Lord would be willing to forgive them of, of all their sinful behavior and he would be willing to take them back. So even as they gather over there and Samuel is interceding for them, the Philistines get to know that a large number of Israelites have gathered over there and they think that this is an excellent time for them to attack. And so at that time, the people cry out to Samuel and they say, do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us. So once again, Samuel intercedes for them so that they are not um, you know, killed by the Philistines. So Samuel was an intercessor. He was their priest. We also see that Samuel was a prophet. And some people say that he was the first prophet which you know, is technically not true because we also had prophets before that. We had Moses, we had Deborah. These were all prophets who were there before Samuel. However, Samuel is called by scholars as the first prophet, maybe because he made it into an official institution. Up to then, prophets were just people whom God chose, and then they would just uh, you know, do whatever God is asking them to do. But now, for the first time, something officially called the institution of prophecy came into existence because he set up uh, many schools of prophecy, many prophetic schools. And um, they are mentioned in a few of the passages in 1 Samuel. 
where it actually talks about the school of prophets which was established by Samuel. And we have two incidents. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10 verses 9 to 11 talk about the school of prophets. And we also have 1 Samuel chapter 19 verses 19 to 20 which also talks about the school of prophets. Can someone look at these two passages and tell me what what strikes you? What is the what is what's the contrast between these two passages? The only reason I'm posing all these questions today is because I see a lot of um, deadness in the class. People are like completely tuned out and very sleepy and tired. And this is just my attempt to kind of you know get your attention. So if you would look at 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 9 to 11, and then 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 19 to 20, in both of these passages, you have the school of prophets being mentioned. And there's a contrast between these two passages. Can anyone just very quickly detect what is the difference between passage 1 and passage 2? 1 Samuel 10, 9 to 11. The second one being 1 Samuel 19, 19 to 20. What is one main contrast between these two passages where the school of prophets are mentioned? Um, in the first passage, this is basically when Saul has not yet become king. He is you know, searching for his uh, father's animals which have strayed away and he comes to Samuel. And that is when uh, Samuel says to him that God is going to appoint you as king. God has chosen you. So this is just in the early days when, uh, when, 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 when Saul has um, not even become king as yet. And even as um, you know, Samuel finishes talking to Saul and Saul is turning away to go back home, the Lord comes upon him in a mighty way. And all the prophets are gathered over there. It's a school of prophecy that he has come to. And even as he's just turning away and leaving from that place, the Holy Spirit comes down upon him in a mighty way. And he begins to prophesy along with all of them. And people are amazed. And, they, and uh, this is what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 11, where it says, uh, when all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? So they're rather suppressed that here is an ordinary man who never had prophesied in his entire life and now he is prophesying. And so they say, is Saul also among the prophets? That is the first incident where we have this mention of the school of prophets. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so in um, okay, for those of you who are online, one of the students read out their version, and in that version, it says, "Has Saul also become a prophet?" Okay. So. Um, um, so there was, uh, so what is the question? Is there any question attached? Yeah, but whatever he was doing must have been some kind of prophesying because when we go back to the original Hebrew Bible over there, it very much says, is he also prophesying in that sense? So yes. Uh, maybe he was dancing, maybe he was shouting, but he was also prophesying. In what style he was doing the prophesying, that uh, maybe your version has elaborated upon. Uh, but one thing is very, very clear, the man prophesied. And the people who, were, who knew him were shocked because he had never been a prophet in his life, but now they saw him prophesying. And so here we see something very beautiful happening. The Lord is kind of putting his mark of approval on this young man and saying, this man, I approve of him. I have chosen him. I have something special planned for his life. And uh, so he joins with the school of prophets and he prophesies. And then when we move to the second passage, which was 1 Samuel 19, 19 to 20, the scenario is very different. It's very sad. 
and now at this time by this time Saul is chasing after David he wants to murder him is trying desperately to find him and David is running for his life he's trying to hide here and there and so he desperately comes to this place called Naoth where he asks Samuel for protection for help and so David hides in Naoth where you are you have another school of prophets established in that place so da uh, so David is hiding over there and when Saul gets to know about it he sends his soldiers to capture him and bring him back so that he can be executed and uh, so in that um, you know if you look at that entire passage the soldiers go over there they want to capture him, but before they can capture him, they all open their mouths and start prophesying. They have no control over themselves. And uh, so they are uh, under, literally under the control of the Holy Spirit and they're unable to do what they came to do. And uh, so he sends a second batch of soldiers. They too go over there and the Holy Spirit comes upon them and takes control of them and they are unable to do what they are meant to do. They just stand over there prophesying. So um, this happens again and again. And... Um, um, so finally Saul himself comes over there he thinks there's no point in sending my soldiers so in verses 23 and 24 of first Samuel chapter 19 he comes over there and then you have um, a description of what God does to him a very scary frightening Bible passage so if we could have someone read out first Samuel chapter 19 verses 23 to 24 So the first time when the people said, can Saul also prophesy? Is he also a prophet? It was a very positive thing that they were saying. But now, now this man is in a fallen state, this murder in his heart. He has made up his mind that he is going to shed the blood of the person anointed by God himself. And God brings judgment upon him. So the second time when he's prophesying, it's not at all something positive. God's judgment is upon him. God humiliates him. God punishes him. God judges him in front of all the people. You know, so he came over there to uh, to do harm to David, but then he is the one who ends up being harmed. So a king, you know, being made to take off his clothes and lie over there in a helpless state. What a humiliation! And all the kingdom must have heard about it and people would have laughed about it. So, you know, uh, God was very angry with the way Saul uh, was functioning. Instead of repenting of his attitude, he was becoming more and more determined to somehow capture David, even though he knew very well that God himself had anointed David. And so we have these two incidents which talk about the school of prophets. And we have the story of Saul told over here in both these passages. And we see such a great contrast. Um, so Saul, who could have had a very positive um, future, instead ends up coming under the judgment of God, where he is literally humiliated in front of his people. Um, another thing about the book of 1 Samuel, uh, we the term Messiah is used for the very first time in First Samuel chapter two, verse ten. So, if we could have someone over here read out First Samuel chapter two, verse ten. The word anointed over there, that basically is the word Messiah that is being used for the very first time. So if you were to look into the Hebrew Bible, the word over there would be Messiah. So that's the word that word is used for the first time over here where God says that one day a king will come whose horn will be exalted because, you know, he would be anointed by God himself. What exactly is this whole idea about a horn, you know, um, being exalted basically um, uh, the imagery is of a bull you know when a bull gets into a fight uh, with another bull or with whatever other wild animal 
I, at the end of the battle, once the bull is victorious, it raises up its horns in victory. So that is basically where the imagery was drawn from. So in those days, in their culture, when they were, whenever they would say the horns are being lifted or exalted, they're basically talking about victory. Okay, so uh, that's basically the imagery. The imagery is being drawn from a bull and the way it acts, the way it lifts up its horns when it has won the victory. So here it is being said that one day when the Messiah is sent, his horn will be exalted. He will be victorious. Okay. Um, so glad to see my class awake. I think I have got their attention now. Uh, it took the humiliation of Saul to wake them up. <laughs> but I'm so glad it has happened. Yeah. All right. Now, um, we see something rather strange regarding this whole kingship stuff. Um, you know, because uh, Samuel is very upset when the people ask for a king. And uh, the Lord is very uh, displeased when the people ask for a king. But it was God in the beginning who said that they would be having kings. And God is even talking about uh, you know, a Messiah who will be sent and he will be exalted. So God wants to have a king. God has prophesied about a king. But when the people ask for a king, God is unhappy. So what is this whole thing? I mean, how do we understand this entire thing? So let's actually look at all the Bible passages related to that. We would have to first look at Genesis chapter 17, verse 6, which uh, someone will read out for us from here. Genesis 17, 6. Okay, so this is a prophecy that God very plainly, clearly gives to Abraham saying, you know what? Your lineage is going to be a great one. Kings are going to come from among your descendants. So God himself is saying that kings will be coming one day from the lineage of Abraham. And then let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 to 15. And if someone could read out that. Look at the wording that is used over here. Um, in uh, verse 14, uh, it says, when you have you know, taken position of the land and you have settled down in it, and at that time when you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God has chosen. OK, so over here, uh, there is no condemnation at all. It doesn't say, uh, when you say those words, you know, let us set a king over us like all the nations, bad people, you shouldn't be saying that. There's no such, um, I know, um, criticism made over there. It's just saying, when you people make that statement, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint someone that the, God, that the Lord himself has anointed and appointed. So there is no kind of um, uh, anger or displeasure from the Lord regarding this matter. But when we come over here to 1 Samuel chapter 8, Samuel is displeased. The Lord is also very, very displeased. So what happened? What went wrong? Maybe we, we would need to read those verses. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 5 to 8, if we could have one person read out. Yeah, please go ahead, yes. Okay, if you read these verses, we get the clear impression that Samuel is not happy about their request and God is most displeased. He says in verse 7, 
it is not you they have rejected but they have rejected me as their king and in verse 8 he says forsaking me and serving other gods so they are doing to you so god is very displeased um it's so it is the lord who first of all said that they would have a king the lord in fact even prophesied and said that this king would be someone who would be anointed and exalted you know in the future he would be anointed and exalted because he would be the messiah all of these things the lord has been saying but finally when the people actually ask for a king god is not happy so we see an explanation for that in first samuel chapter 8 itself verses 19 to 20 so if you know if you can very uh, someone can read out for us and if the rest of us you can really concentrate on what these verses are saying okay so the problem seems to be the motive with which they are asking god does want them to have a king and god wants them to have a king in his timing not in their timing uh, but the attitude with which they are asking is wrong why do they want to be like all the other nations because if they have a king he can lead them into battle and fight their battles for them so the motive here is wrong they are kind of feeling insecure being under the command uh, you know be, being under the command of an invisible god whom they cannot see whom they cannot hear if they have a physical king in front of them the king will say okay you bunch go that side and fight you bunch go this side and fight someone who can know whom they can see and hear it would be easy for them you don't need any spiritual maturity to be able to see an actual king and hear his voice on the other hand if the king if, if god is the commander of the army then you would need a little bit of spiritual maturity because then they would have to turn to the priest the priest will speak to the lord and the lord will give directions on what is to be done and they don't want to operate in this way because they are very very fleshly and human in their behavior in their attitudes and they not they have no desire to grow spiritually so they want to be like all the other nations in the wrong sense they don't want to have to depend on the lord or grow in him and learn to hear from him they want it easy just like all the other kings just listen to a human king and do whatever the king says they also want to come down to that level and that is why the lord says they have rejected me as their king i am the one who led them into battles and gave them miraculous victories i did uh, i i changed the laws of physics you know uh, uh, god parted the sea uh god uh, created havoc among the enemy where they killed each other these are all things almighty things which their commander did and now they're saying no no we don't want that commander because it takes a little bit of too much commitment we we need to stay in line with him we need to be pleasing to him if we you know go go into sin then he will not be there for us so they want to continue living their immoral lifestyle and uh, they want to have a human king so the whole attitude with which they asked for a king was highly wrong and also of course it would have been maybe more polite if they had said lord in your timing can you give us a king but no they were like give us a king now we want the king now so they were they did not care about god's timing and they also had the very very wrong motive in their hearts about why they wanted a king and that is the reason why god was displeased but originally god did want them to have a king he wanted to give them a king in his timing and he wanted them to have the right hearts when they would ask for a king but that was not the case and so the lord was displeased with them um moving on very quickly to maybe what else we can cover in this uh, book um people generally bring up this particular verse first samuel chapter 16 verse 14 and there's a lot of debate that goes on regarding that so if we could have one person read out first samuel chapter 16 verse 14 and then we'll see if we can try to understand what is being said okay so um um in the version which was read out over here it said that the spirit of the lord departed from saul and a distressing spirit from the lord came upon him you know um so um different 
versions, English versions, try to use different words. Uh, you know, they say distressing spirit, they say harmful spirit, um, they say, um, they try to avoid the term evil spirit because evil spirits clearly sounds demonic. So they just try to, you know, use other terms. But then if you go back to the original Hebrew, you basically have good and bad. Good would be tov and bad would be ra. And very clearly it says over there that the spirit which came was ra. It was evil. Okay, so there's no avoiding the fact that this was definitely an evil spirit that is being talked about. So the question which is raised is, how could God send an evil spirit to trouble someone? Uh, he, he, he could have sent a holy angel to trouble him. Why did he send an evil spirit? Okay, so that is the question which is generally raised. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, so the, the student um, over here who is pointing out the fact that uh, when the final you know, plague was sent in Egypt, and the angel of death was sent. Um, that was an uh, that was an angel of death, a negative uh, force. So now I don't know whether over there God released evil spirits to come and do the killing, or God used His angels to bring judgment. I'm not sure about that. Uh, so angel of death over there could be uh, someone from the Lord's own army, or it might have been. Um, you know, so I'm not very sure about that. But over here, very clearly, it is an evil spirit from the Lord which is being sent. How would we understand something like this? Uh, we who live in New Testament times have a little more clarity regarding these things because of things, events which are mentioned in our New Testament. Maybe we can learn some lessons from the New Testament and apply them to this particular passage in the Old Testament. And of course, I'm referring to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 to 5, where it talks about a man who was living in immorality. Openly, he was living in immorality. And all the people in the church were thinking, oh, this is an all right thing to do. You know, so um, it was a very terrible situation. And so over there, this is what Paul instructs should be done. Uh, you know, regarding this particular person. Um, yeah, so, so if we could actually have someone read out First Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 to 5. Okay, so over here. Uh, the instruction that is very clearly given is this man is living in outright sin and is not even uh, feeling guilty about it. And the rest of the church members are thinking, oh, okay, this is, a, this is an all right thing to do. And so he needs to be excommunicated. He must be removed from the church and not allowed to enter the church anymore. And so basically when he's removed from the church, uh, what is happening in the supernatural realm is that the protection of God which covers his people is going to be withdrawn from this person. So it's not just a social excommunication. There's something happening even at the spiritual level. At the social level, yes, the believers are going to excommunicate him. But at the spiritual level, God is withdrawing his covering from this particular person. You know, it's I'm not sure that you have ever really consciously thought about it. But in your homes, you are under the covering of your parents. When you are in a church, you are under the spiritual covering of the senior pastor. And depending on what kind of a person that person is, the one who is under, who's under whose covering you are, it can have a great impact upon your life. You know, um, for instance, I mean, those of us who are from families where the spiritual covering uh, is not there in the sense that your parents have not yet become, you know, believers who have made a commitment to the Lord, uh, that makes it harder. For you, I mean, because um, you know you are a believer, but um, the evil one can attack to a greater extent simply because the head of the house is not able to provide an adequate covering, and there's always greater conflict, greater battles that you have to go through. Uh, it's the same even in a church when the senior pastor is not providing the covering that is required it does harm the congregation so over here it's a very serious thing that's happening when this person is removed from the church 
even the covering and protection of god is going to be removed and he's going to stand completely exposed to the evil one so it's almost literally like handing over the man to satan it's like almost like you know saying to satan you know this man is now fully you know vulnerable you can do what you want with him but when god does this his intention is not for evil why is this being done so that that flesh of that man that sinful nature of that man can be destroyed because right now he's thinking oh this is a wonderful way to live the sinful lifestyle is really cool it's really good is what he is thinking but once he gets into the hands of satan and there's no covering protecting him then he'll know how wonderful satan is and how wonderful are satan's ways he will fully experience what it feels like to be under satan and his flesh would be destroyed he would come to his senses and he would understand how much better to be under the protection of my lord god and he would come back so with that intention he is turned over to satan so that he can understand what actually happens when a person's uh, is left to satan and the lord is no longer covering and protecting them uh, so in second corinthians chapter 2 verses 6 to 10 we see the result of this treatment second corinthians chapter 2 verses 6 to 10 uh, where it says in verse 7 um you know now this man has repented of his sin he has fully experienced satan he has understood how terrible it is and now it says uh you know you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow and then in verse 11 it says you know you need to do this because in order that satan might not outwit us for we are not unaware of his schemes so now that this person has repented paul instructs and says bring him back into the fold let him come back under the covering of you know the corporate uh, the, the church so that you know satan cannot take advantage of him any more okay so in that sense even here in the old testament uh, is my assumption that god allowed an evil spirit to come and torment saul not because god hated saul but because god wanted to give him a chance to change now did saul change <laughs> that is another question um how much time do we have okay we have time um so we see that saul um is no longer hearing from god and uh, god is no longer speaking to him because he is not repenting the man is not repenting so the lord is, is not talking to him anymore and so uh, when the philistines gather Uh, a huge army gathers against them saul is so desperate he goes to the lord for instructions god keeps silent god doesn't say a word why because this man is only wants to see what he can get out of it he doesn't care about honoring the lord he doesn't care about god's will he just wants to know can we win this battle or not he so he's not really going over there with the right attitude so god keeps quiet god does not tell him what to do and he's so desperate he thinks fine let me go to a medium a witch um someone who practices black magic let me go to that person maybe at least they will give me some guidance some help and so he you know, that that happens in first samuel chapter 28 where saul stoops to an extent where he goes to someone who is on the devil's side to ask for guidance because the man is now in such a desperate state but then let's not criticize Saul too much because in first samuel uh, first samuel chapter 28 we see david also doing something extremely ungodly and stupid david is getting ready to fight along with the philistines against the anointed of god okay so No, it's not exactly david who is shining over here in this chapter both of them are at a really low spiritual level david is at a low spiritual level getting ready to fight against his own people with the philistines saul terrified that such a huge army is coming against him doesn't know where to turn goes to a witch for uh, advice so both of them are doing rather bad over here in this particular passage but uh coming to the end of first uh, samuel chapter 28 verse 19 where you have you know samuel coming up um out of i don't know not it's not exactly out of the grave but anyway he he makes his, he makes a physical appearance over there and um this is what samuel says if you could have someone read out first samuel chapter 28 verse 19 
okay so um samuel who is now dead and who has now come in spirit form to talk to saul this is what he says he says you will lose the battle the philistines will win but tomorrow you and your sons will be with me um nobody would say that samuel is in hell <laughs> we would definitely say that samuel is in heaven so uh, and moreover it says your sons will be with me and i don't know much about the sons of saul because nothing much is given in the bible but we do know one righteous son jonathan who was killed in that battle so if jonathan is um, going to be in heaven with samuel and it says over here you and your sons will be with me so i'm assuming at the end of it all probably even saul made it into heaven so the lord's purpose was never to destroy saul uh, but he gave him opportunities to repent he allowed an evil spirit to torment him again and again hoping that it would drive him back into the arms of god but this man i think probably just didn't want to hear god you know maybe he just hardened his heart to an extent where he really didn't want to hear but there must have been some goodness in him that the lord saw and so he allowed him to come into his presence after his death so we don't really know the details uh, but we see that saul actually ends his life in a very tragic and terrible manner um if anyone has got any vital important doubts we can get into that others maybe we can take a look at saul's death and how he died will it be questions or will it be the death scene of saul which one would you prefer shall we just go ahead um, because you see here you have two accounts of yeah there's a question bubbling go ahead ah oh, we'll discuss that later because the online students have got nothing to do with it okay, okay. yeah okay this is just about the, uh, uh, the written assignment for the students over here so you don't need to concern yourselves about that uh, so um let's move into you know the two accounts about samuel's death so sorry saul uh, regarding saul's death in first samuel chapter 31 verses 1 to 6 uh, it's it uh, we we are told that saul killed himself um and then when we come to second samuel chapter 1 verses 4 to 10 there's an amalekite who says that he is the one who killed saul so uh, is the bible contradicting itself uh, you know is there a mistake being made in the bible so we would uh, need to kind of resolve that we need to kind of touch upon that so uh, just to very quickly you know talk about this because we don't have much time left um in first samuel chapter 31 verses 1 to 6 it very clearly uh, describes the the various events that you know uh, led to the final suicide uh, the philistines have won and saul realizes that next they're going to come and you know take hold of him and he doesn't want to die at the hands of these philistines you know with whom he had a struggle his entire life and he doesn't want any of them killing him so he feels it's better for him to you not know, die rather than um, um uh, you know die with so you know by his own hand rather than have any of those terrible people touch him okay so he's kind of in that kind of uh, mode you know um, and uh, so he actually commits suicide but over here when we come to second samuel chapter 1 verses 4 to 10 you have an amalekite coming and boasting in front of david and saying you know what uh, i am the one who killed him so we would probably have to accept the fact i mean at least this is what sounds correct to me and to many of the scholars they say that most probably in second samuel chapter 1 the amalekite was lying because he was trying to gain favor with david and we can actually have some good reasoning you know to support what we are saying uh, because you know if the armor bearer the arm the Saul's armor bearer once he sees that his king is dead he is the man who is supposed to protect the king and the king has killed himself just now so he is so horrified and shattered that he could not fulfill his duty that he also kills himself now if the armor bearer had still been alive you think he would have allowed this amalekite to peacefully come over there and take his crown and take his uh, arm band and walk off no the armor bearer would have killed him so the amalekite when he came over there 
he would have seen both of them already lying dead. Then he takes the crown, he takes the armband and thinks up a scheme. If I go and give this to, the, to David and say, you know, I am the one who killed, David would be really happy and say, oh, wow, I'm so glad you helped me. But, you know, of, of course, David does not do that. Another thing, uh, a very valid argument, which I read somewhere, uh, is that would Saul ask an Amalekite of all the people on earth, would he ask an Amalekite to kill him? Because he hates the Amalekites' guts. You see, they are the reason that God finally takes the throne away from him. God says to him, wipe out the Amalekites. And what does this man do? He disobeys God very deliberately. And because of that, his kingdom is snatched away from him. I seriously doubt he would ask an Amalekite to kill him. He did not want to be, he did, he did not want to die at the hands of the Philistines, he says, rather than allow one of those horrible Philistines to touch me, I'd rather kill myself. And a man like that, you think he would have asked, requested an Amalekite to kindly kill him? No way. So the Amalekite in chapter um, 2 Samuel is most definitely lying. And um, yeah, David does not reward him for his lie. Uh, rather, you know, he is um, executed. So uh, there are two versions of Saul's death. And the first one is correct, because over there, all the details are given about how exactly it happened. On the other hand, in 2 Samuel, you just have the words of an Amalekite. And he was, uh, you know, most probably lying, uh, because whatever he is saying does not really add up. OK, so um, there are other things to be said, because after all, 1 Samuel is a historical book, and it's filled with history and lots of events. But then we are out of time, so we will uh, close. And now, in the three minutes that we have left, any brilliant questions? Why are you looking to your spokesman? If you want to ask the question, you ask him why. <laughs> We'll, we'll get to, at least let's finish with the online students. Okay, so let's close with a word of prayer. Yeah. Okay. Um, Lord, we just thank you so much for the lessons that we could learn from this uh, book of the Bible. We pray, oh Lord, that as and when required, you would bring these things back to our mind so that we will apply them in our own lives, in our own situations, and honor you, oh Lord. We pray that we would not allow ourselves to waste the second chances that are given to us the way Saul did. He was given many opportunities, O Lord, to change his ways, uh, but he was foolish. And we pray that we would not be um, foolish in the same manner, but that, Lord, we would have a soft heart like David, who was always willing to re repent and admit his sinfulness and turn back to you. So we pray, O Lord, that we would be like David and not like uh, Saul regarding our repentance. We also pray, O oh Lord, that uh, we would learn from Samuel and his character, uh, a man, O oh Lord, who always stayed faithful to you, did what was your will, uh, was such a blessing to his entire nation because he was always your hands and your feet, O oh Lord. Whatever you wanted done, he did it, O oh Lord. Help us to be like that so that we can be a blessing uh, to our own people in our nation, O oh Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord. Uh, for today's uh, lesson, and we pray that you would be with each student, even as they go about the rest of their responsibilities. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, online students, for you know joining us for the class, and uh, we'll meet again tomorrow.